Thanks, Tom. Right. Uh, so before we get into that, got this other thing. So um, these two things are related. The relationship will become apparent later. So um, because nobody volunteered to speak, I thought, oh, I'll grab something out of the archives. So this is dating back to a project I did, I think, in 2011. So it's quite, it, yeah, I was about to say, the Catalyst logo was different in those days, and I was going to remove it, and then I thought, no, nah, it's a piece of history. We'll leave it there. Um, also, um, the slides were optimised for um, 1024 by 768. So see that bit up the top? Doesn't, yeah, yeah. anyway. If you've ever seen my slides with this template and wondered, what is that weird shape? It, it's because there's some controls up there that you don't normally need to see. Um, but anyway. <laughs> um, right, so I am a, um, amongst many things, a Perl programmer. And one of the reasons why I historically used Perl is because of the enormous number of um, modules, Perl modules, on um, the Comprehensive Perl Archive Network, CPAN. Um, there are thousands of them up there, and the cool kids today are, are doing the same thing with, with Ruby Gems and, and Python eggs or wheels or whatever the hell they're called. Um, yeah. Um, and obviously JavaScript has uh, NPM, um, which um, is the same concept for the different languages. Um, now, one of the issues with, with having access to an enormous amount of pre-written code is finding things. Um, it's all very well searching, but searching is... is good for when you know what you're looking for. Um, having built a number of um, interfaces to different types of data, often you want to search for when you know what you're looking for and a browse for when you don't. Um, and so this talk is, a, is about um, browsing and it's about one particular type of data visualization, of which this is an example. So this was a map um, that um, Randall, is it Randall, Randall Munro, yeah, who who does the XKCD website, he created this map in 2006, uh, a map of the internet, um, where where basically he's just taken the IPv4 address space and and laid it out, and to give you an idea of how old this is, um, and the key. The green bits of unallocated space. <laughs> there hasn't been any of that for some time now. Uh, we ran out because you squandered them. Um, so I saw this map and thought I could do something similar for CPAN, the modules on CPAN, and st so started an adventure. Um, Interestingly, so I, so I was inspired by XKCD. I did the search um, for the phrase inspired by XKCD and there's 50,000 results, or there were in 2011. It's actually gone down a bit recently. Um, and 50,000 is, is an amazing number. If I could inspire 50,000 of anything with poorly drawn stick figures and advanced maths, um, I would be exceedingly proud. Um, apparently, the last time I gave this talk, which was about a year after I originally did it, I, I revisited the search and I got 150,000 results. I thought, wow, that's amazing. And then for some reason, I was in another browser where I wasn't logged in to Google, tried the same search and got 60,000. And that led me to wonder if there were 90,000 things out there that had been inspired by XKCD that Google thinks you don't need to know about, but apparently I do. Uh, maybe. Anyway. 
So I wasn't the first person to think of mapping um, CPAN and, and not even the first person to actually do it. Um, the guy who did this, um, whose name is in my notes, but I'm sorry, I've forgotten them, um, created this thing that is showing the relationships, like the dependencies between the different modules. Um, and so that, that's kind of interesting um, in, in different ways and it allows you to scroll around and zoom in and, and um, explore it but ultimately when you zoom in essentially you just see bigger dots. Um, you, you can read the text but there's nothing else there. Um, around the same time that I was thinking of doing this, um, this website metacpan.org had come online now, there'd been a site for many years called search.cpan.org, which you could use to search CPAN, but one of the unusual features of it was that it was not open source. So Graham Barr, who built the site, um, shared the source to the website that he was hosting with some of his close um, friends or, or collaborators, and they added features that, that they wanted. Um, but other people who had great ideas didn't have access to the source, so they couldn't change search.cpan. So a bunch of people got together and came up with this website, and they were doing uh, two things. One is they were building what they felt was a better search and browse tool, but the other thing was that they were building it by making a back end that was open. So anybody could make their own front end. Um, they, they built the two bits, and obviously they, they made features of the back end that would support the front end, um, and, and they each drove each other a bit. So this site existed, and you could um, hit their API endpoints and send queries and get JSON data back, um, and it was awesome. So I thought, well, I can combine these things. So what I wanted to do, if, if we go back to this picture here, what um, Randall Munro had done is taken essentially a list, so a, like a, a one-dimensional um, thing, which was the numbers one, or zero to 255. So he'd taken that list and then laid it out in a two-dimensional space um, using an algorithm um, called the Hilbert curve. So I just was experimenting um, to see how that would work and did the same thing um, and came up with this, which had a number of disadvantages. One is that it's, it's exceedingly ugly. Um, I, I did it manually, so I, I put it together in Inkscape. I was really just understanding how this Hilbert curve thing worked and, and such like. Uh, it's, it's super low resolution. What, what I did here was I, I took um, modules and grouped them together in namespaces, which is something that most of the other languages don't have in their archives. They're not namespaced, so... Um, yeah. Yeah. So, it, for example, in the Python world, everything either begins or ends with PY, and that's about it. Um, so, um, and and this this was just a static image, um, and not very useful. But I I was mainly getting to grips with the data and and learning things about the data. So it was a good first start. So this is the data that I was working with. So if you um, go to one of the CPAN mirrors, so that you can download Perl modules from mirrors all around the place, um, this file, 02 packages, um, is available. It's a gzip file and it looks like this. So it's plain text. And it contains, in this column here, a module name. And over here, a version number if there's one available, and then the path from the root of the mirror to the file that contains that module. So 
somebody might upload a file, like this P voice file. This file is repeated multiple times, and these are things that are inside that file. So this is a distribution, and these are modules. And when I started, I was just looking at this first column, and I was mapping the distributions and the size of the, sorry, the mapping the modules, and the size of the colored shapes related to how many lines that were in this file that used a certain namespace. But that was kind of misleading um, it, because one um, distribution might contain thousands of modules. Um, not many do have that many, but it was a bit misleading. So I ended up just concentrating on this bit, which tells me two different things. It tells me um, the namespace of the distribution and also the um, identifier for the, the maintainer or the author who uploaded that. So I went through and came up with a list of the unique distribution names. So here, this occurs four times, so I would have counted that once. Um, counted this distribution once, but this namespace, another distribution in the namespace would increment my count. So, I found all these distributions, deduped them, and sorted them alphabetically. And here I've given them different colours, although that concept came a bit later, but you, the point of the colours here is that you can see that all these ones are in the same namespace. This is the ACME namespace, which exists for joke modules. Um, the idea is that you wouldn't go there for something that you were going to include in production, um, but, but many have. Um, and I don't know that I have. Did you have a particular thing in mind? No, 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 I have not. Uh, but there's, there's some cool code there. Um, so that orange area is Acme, a bit further along here. There's some algorithm modules and there's some Apache modules, um, DBD, which is the database drivers, and DBI <coughs> off into the world. And you'll notice I've, I've put along the bottom this chain. So basically I've just put these in order, like a list, and they're all links in a chain. As I, I mentioned, it's, it's a one-dimensional uh, thing, and I want to make a map which is two-dimensional. So one way of doing that would just be to arrange the chain backwards and forwards like that, um, and the, the coloured areas would sort of end up as stripes, um, and that would be boring. Instead, um, I turned to, um, a, this is an area of, of mathematics, where there's these two different questions which turn out to be the same thing. What I was wanting to do was take this list of things and distribute them on a plane. Um, so that's one question you might try and answer. Um, another way of looking at my looking at it might be if you took the plane and divided it into cells, what path would you need to follow to visit every cell on that plane exactly once? So this is how mathematicians think about it and this is how I was thinking about it, but it's the same thing. Um, and there are many algorithms in this family, it's called space filling algorithms. Um, and one of them, which is the one from the original um, XKCD map, is called the Hilbert Curve. So if you wanted to visit these four um, cells on this plane, you'd do so in on a path that effectively is a U shape. Now, you, you could have started anywhere. It might have looked like an N or a C or a backward C like this does, but it, it, effectively it's some orientation of a U shape. Now, if the plane was twice as big, then you could take that U shape and visit this quadrant, and then this quadrant, and then this one, and then this one. So on a bigger scale, it's the U shape again in a different orientation. 
um, and it would look like that. And then if you made that twice as wide and twice as high, you could go around and you can see that this section in the top left quadrant is kind of on its own, there's no crossings over there, and then there's one line comes down into this quadrant, and then one goes across to here, and one goes up to there. And the advantage of this is that it's one long chain coming in here and going out there, but because it winds back on itself, areas, uh, sorry, um, things from your original list that are adjacent end up making an area rather than a stripe. So that's how that Hilbert curve works. Um, fortunately, I didn't have to worry too much about that because there was a module on CPAN um, called Math Plane Path Hilbert Curve. And it's part of a distribution by Kevin Ride called Math Plane Path that has lots and lots of different um, <coughs> space filling algorithms. And I was, so to use it, I, I had to load the module, obviously installed it first, load the module create an instance of that object, and then use the object, passing it a number being the index in the list, and it returns x, y values. I was really surprised at how, how simple that was. I was thinking I was going to need to, when I created this, this object, tell it the dimensions that I was trying to fill, but it turns out that this particular algorithm always fills from the top left corner out um, and so it tells you how big your plane is going to be. Um, so this is the first version that was automatically generated um, and the, the path starts here and goes around and over there and such like. Now this looks like an image. If I tempt the demo gods and go to this page here. Right. But it's actually a table, an HTML table. So you can see that the point that I'm hovering over, I've got a hover effect in CSS, and so anywhere I pause, I get the title <laughs> attribute of, of what that thing is. So that big yellow space is the net um, namespace. Um, this first green one will be Acme up here, and these are individual files. And it does nothing else, um, and it turns out that uh, if you have um, an HTML document with this many elements in it, um, particularly in 2011, um, your browser did not like you. It was quite slow to interact with, um, slow to load, um, and painful. And that's when it's not really doing anything except telling you what you're hovering over. So if I go back. But that was interactive, and that whole thing was generated using someone else's code, so that was cool. Um, the other, other thing I didn't mention before was I made an, uh, an arbitrary decision that any distribution that was in a namespace of its own was relatively uninteresting. Um, and if there were two in the namespace, I was still not interested. So I just set a threshold. and I. I ended up with the number 30, I think. So any namespace with less than 30 modules in it is down submerged under the primordial soup, which is the blue, um, and any with 30 or more is, is an area of its own color. So this, I think, is still um, HTML. Um, but a little bit more um, interactive. You, it, there's a thing you can zoom in on. It. I won't bother with that. Um, so then, oh, actually, no, maybe it wasn't. So I think that one actually is a PNG image. Um, 
So I used the, I think the imager library from CPAN to generate this PNG and put the text on it. Um, so you could see the name for each of these areas, um, which added more information but made it considerably more untidy. Um, and then the next iteration, um, I decided that um, I would generate multiple sizes of the map. So it's not tiled, it's just there's a really big one which <laughs> is zoomed in and a really small one roughly like this. And on, on the big one, every space would be labelled um, and on, on the small one, some of them don't have labels and, and you would zoom in through the interface um, to see things. So I put that together using jQuery, jQuery UI. Sammy JS was a, a library um, for routing, which um, I might touch on later. Or I might not. But one of the things, I, so I ended up with a very interactive site, but my website only serves static files. So the browser comes along, it gets um, an HTML file which ha refers to some JavaScript and it refers to the seven map images at the different zoom levels. Um, and the map images are updated every eight hours or something by a cron job. Um, so apart from that, your browser never goes back to my server. Everything from then on is interacting with the APIs on, on metacpan.org. That's what I said. So it looks like this, and it might work if I go there. I had all sorts of plans back in 2011 about what I might add to it. Um, I've done none of them. Uh, Catalyst is the name of a web um, application framework in the Perl world. Um, it's completely unrelated to Catalyst IT here in New Zealand. So this is um, the map. Um, has some stuff over here which you can make narrower or wider. Um, you can z zoom in in some of those um, names have come into play. Now you'll see I, I accidentally, as it happens, I clicked on this space here. So it's highlighting the distribution that I selected and um, when I clicked on it, it went away using the API to get information about that module or distribution. I'll call them modules because it's easier to say. So um, this is one completely at random algorithm, NAP01DP, which solves the 0-1 NAPSAC problem. Well, there you go, using dynamic programming technique. So. One of the things that you can do then is you can view the module documentation right here. So I went away and got that, ran it as HTML, um, and then there's links here that will take you off the site um, to MetaCPAN to look at the same page on their site or the, the distribution with links to all the other things in it or other things that this um, author has uploaded. Um, does it? Yes, cool. Um, other things that you can see here is if we were to click on dependencies. Sorry, I should have plugged my mouse in. That was not what I was trying to click on. Hang on. Would you believe it? I put the USB in upside down. Right. So if I clicked on dependencies, uh, it has none. Brilliant. <laughs> if we 
picked another one at random. Has it got dependencies? Yes, it depends on all these things. Um, and these things are required only during testing. Um, actually, you only need these ones to run it, these ones to test it, and these ones if you're developing on it. This person is very tidy. Most people don't split up their dependencies into the phases. And you might think, well, this person's very tidy. What other cool stuff have they done? Because it'll be awesome. Um, they've released 12 different things, which are now these blue spots on the map flashing away, but you kind of can't see at the lower resolution. Um, and there's a bunch of things that they've written there, um, including as recently as the third of this month. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then um, there's also this concept of reverse dependencies where you could see which other things depend on this one, um, which is probably, in this case, blank. Um, if we went back and picked one of these. Um, that one looks fun. And said, who depends on this module? Then you can see spots all over the map, including some in the primordial soup. So if I hover over that one, you can see up the top of the screen, it's up in these areas here, it's telling you what I'm hovering over. Hmm. FVWM Piazza. ETLP. Lots of cool stuff. Um, so then going back to that home page, um, you don't necessarily know what you're looking for, as I say. Um, sorry. So I've arranged some tours. If, if you wanted to um, see which maintainers had the most distributions uploaded, this guy here wins by a country mile with 1,731 distributions. Um, there's some other pretty big numbers up there. I've got about a dozen and none maintained in the last five or six years, probably. Um, so yeah, you can, if we click on this one, you can see um, he's got every single one in this space. Perinci is probably some sort of application with pluggable modules or something. And he's got every one of these as well. What's that? SAH. Hmm. Some sort of schema system there. Yeah. So people have these interesting um, areas that they focus on. So, hang on, is that as much zoomed out as I can? So, basically what's happening here is, is what you saw when it was growing, and in fact I can show you uh, later. But this, this area here is a square made up of four big quadrants, and then once that filled up, that it, it sort of went down here and across here and up to here. Then it overflowed into this space and filled up um, these four quadrants and now it's spilled out to yeah, there. Yeah, you didn't normalize it into a square. It is, it is yeah, I'm not even sure how you would do that. Um, at, when I first did it, we had these four big areas and one and a bit more, which meant that it was here and here and a bit of that. And so I did a little bit of um, massaging the numbers so that that bit went down here yeah. and, and that 
kind of worked better. And then once it was nearly full, I switched it back and it sort of came. I can't even recall how it filled up, but anyway, it did. And now it's, it's fallen out there. And it will continue as long as people keep uploading things to um, CPAN. I'd I, I not only could I, I'm going to inflict that on you shortly. <laughs> yeah. um, but you don't actually need to have old copies of that metadata because it's all available on MetaCPAN. So you can query their API and, and f you could get a list of modules, but I had that already. But for any given module, you could say what was the date that this was first released um, and what's every date that there's been a release since then. So all that information's available. And you might be thinking, yeah, well, you just said as long as people keep uploading things to CPAN, but as we all know, Pearl's dead, so why would they do that? But this down here is a ticker showing things uploaded in the last 48 hours or so. Um, if we go back to the home page, um, recent uploads, which in fact I could have clicked on that if I'd remembered. Um, these, these are things that have been uploaded recently, where recently is the last four, three and a bit days. Um, so most of this information, it's going away and getting it from MetaCPAN um, at the time you click on things. Um, I did some naughty tricks um, to, so the map itself doesn't update in real time. So three times a day the cron job runs and, and generates new maps. So this ticker is populated by a query that goes to MetaCPAN, um, but when it gets the data back, there might be a new new module that, that wasn't there when I made the map, and so um, clicking on one of these um, could theoretically get you an error because it didn't know what to do with it. Um, so when I populate this ticker, I throw away any modules that aren't on the map so that nobody gets confused. And if they come back eight hours later, they will be there. So that's all good. Um, what? Oh yeah, there's even, that was a feature I added. So I did change it after I uploaded it, once or twice. So you can go straight to the change log. And that's an intriguing format. Um, looks pretty much like a, like a git log. That's nothing to do with me. That's just how that particular person chose to do it. If we click on this one, it'll be more sane. That's cool. I've never seen a to-do in a change log before. It's a good way to get people to notice what you'd like them to send your patches for. Anyway, there's that. Um, back on the sightseeing tours, um, this one here is on Meta CPAN. Uh, this is probably their um, API has changed in the six years since I last touched the code, so it says timeout somewhere in there, but that's a lie. It's my faulty error handling. But what that should have done is give me a list of pe of modules that um, people have hit the, eff effectively, the like button on, on their site. It's a plus plus button, because this is Pearl. Um, these are ones that people have liked recently-ish. recent uploads we saw. This is maintainers who've updated their profiles. So, you notice it didn't have a photo before and now it does. And I think now it's remembered that so straight away. So, some of the things that it goes and gets from MetaCPAN, it caches so it doesn't have to get them again. Um, and, I think that's about all I wanted to say on that. Um, you can also um, search 
even though it is fundamentally a browsing tool. So oh, I've even got a button for that. So if I if I typed to show off my neglected modules, what's it say? Sort by date. Two have been updated this year, which is two more than I remember. Um, and the most scary thing here in all of this, this is a module that you should never, ever use. Um, so if we click on reverse dependencies, these are the modules on CPAN that use it. Uh, just. I thought it was a good idea when I wrote it. It rapidly became apparent that it was not. Um, but because it has the word simple in the name, people are drawn to it <laughs> like flies to a rotting carcass, which is pretty much what it is. Um, is this supply chain attached uh, with everything? No. <laughs> no. Um, so I, people send me patches for it all the time. Um, but I just am not interested. I don't want to make it better um, because I don't want people to use it. I've literally written a book on how to use the other module that you should be using instead and I point people at that. Um, no. Um, and th the thing is, the issue is in the Perl world people care about backwards compatibility. So that's why I'm not touching it because there's code that relies on it and the least I can do is not break their code. I mean, it is broken already. They just haven't encountered the particular data that will cause them the pain. Um, but hang on, if I go. <laughs> what you get. Um, so. It is. It is. It lulls you in <laughs> to a false sense of security. It's even got a soundtrack. So the, the dots that are appearing, flashing up there, that's an upload of a module that's never been on CPAM before. Um, that's correct. So every time one dot comes on here, this bit here advances a bit further. And so this ACME area will only ever kind of get bigger and not really move unless things are added there. Whereas um, these ones are moving a bit and as you move around, they're moving faster and faster. There's a whole bunch of But, yeah, it is a bit. Um, but yeah, as Tom's muttering over there, this is just a list and then a space filling algorithm applied. Now it's about to get fun. Up here in the Acme namespace in June, here we go, watching here. <laughs> <laughs> the whole bunch. What happened there was there was a conference and they had a workshop on, on how to upload things to, to CPAN and they all <laughs> uploaded something into the Acme namespace. Um, And then it spilled out the end, because that's what it does. And then that was the end of the data that I had available then. So that was a little bit of API work and then just um, re-rendering. Um, one, one thing I, I didn't mention um, earlier was, was the colours. 
essentially it's just four colours because um, any map only requires a maximum of four colours to not have, have two side by side. Um, no doubt there's a very clever algorithm for working that out, but I don't know it. And so my code just works through each of these namespaces and, and grabs one of the four colours that doesn't match the, the one next to it. And then if it needs to, it backtracks and tries a different one of the remaining colours. Correct, correct, because they, they can come in contact. You might get two where the diagonals touch. Um, that probably there with a grass and the green one just that sort of Yes, yeah, but you wouldn't get green next to green. So I don't need the fifth colour in that respect, but it's there kind of being, as I say, the primordial soup. So you're saying that you only ever need four no matter what the arrangement of squares are. Yeah, and it wouldn't even matter if they, if they weren't square. You, you can't make, on a 2D plane, you can't make shapes that interact in ways where you would need more than four colours. Yeah. Has that been proven? Yes. Yes. Absolutely, and that was uh, sorry. That was how I got onto the subject of colours. When I made the animation, I locked in. I generated the last frame first, locked in those colours from the beginning. So, so, so yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right, that's right. But you didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Grant cheats yet again. Um, there's probably quite a few of you here who haven't. Um, Use Pearl and might not be familiar um, with this man. Damien Conway is an Australian computer scientist. If you ever get the opportunity to hear him speak, go and, and do it. And he's got lots of talks on, on YouTube, or a number of talks anyway. Um, so this module, Acme Bleach, um, You feed it a Perl script like this, and it turns it into this. And it still works. So what's happened there is he, he's encoded this source code of your script into spaces and tabs. So it looks empty, but it isn't. Um, and when you, so the only thing readable in there is, is use Acme Bleach, which does the reverse decoding and, and then evals it effectively. Um, the, the genesis of this is that he put an entry into a Perl, I think it must have been an obfuscated Perl competition, coding competition, and the rules said that your entry had to be under... 800 characters, excluding white space. And he read that back <laughs> and thought, ooh. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's done some amazing things. Um, so that was the map of CPAN. Now, so I don't really And we've seen the movie, so that's all good. Um, so that's that. Any questions about that bit before I move on? Ouch. I have a tangential question, which is, yes. as, as we both lamented at the start of the talk, other package management things don't have hierarchies. And who decides what goes where in the Perl CPAN? Oh, I, I the the people who upload it decide. Naming your package, you, you choose your namespace. That's you right. Know, it's a catalyst package. Yep. It's a, you yep. Okay. And there are there are so norms. There are norms. There are people who, who point out <coughs> you should have done X or Y. Um, like the DBI module, the database interface, is effectively a namespace on its own. 
nothing else is in the DBI module. And there's a there's a loose convention that if you upload something in a space, you own that space. Um, but um, That's right. So, yeah, other people upload things, Catalyst, colon, colon, something else. But with the DBI one, the convention was if your thing extends DBI, it should be in the DBI X namespace. Um, but, you know, rules are made to be broken. Um, people do things in different ways. Um, the, and, and, yeah, the, the lack of a hierarchy... For for other package um, sites is is a bit of a shame. Um, the other thing that's a bit of a shame is that you don't have ready access to this metadata in the same way for the other sites. Like npm, for example, npm is a company, I believe. Is that right, Jean? So it's that that data is is their their sort of yeah the the intellectual property. Right. Yep. Python, for example, of course, has big frameworks like Django and stuff, but they've also got AsyncIO, and AsyncIO code is not compatible with non-AsyncIO code. Oh, joy. And yep. there's no namespace, right? So, so they've kind of adopted AIO HTTP or right. AIO requests and so on. Yep. But because there's this whole branch of the Python language where if you're using that, you can't really use the other stuff at the same time. Namespace would have solved a whole lot of yeah. problems that they just, it's just all in this big morass, uh, which I... Mm. And probably can never be fixed for that reason. Right, so that's what I was actually going to talk about. What I said I was going to talk about was this thing. So you can see where it came from. Um, this was a lightning talk which surprised me when I opened it up. I thought, oh, I could do this one. Ah, oh, lightning talk. Anyway, so, you've seen that story, so we'll skip over that. So it was inspired by, um, interesting. Um, so my map was inspired by this cartoon on XKCD. Oh, going back a bit, um, you know, I said there were 50,000 hits for inspired by XKCD. To put that into perspective, does anyone know what XKCD stands for? Correct. He chose that because there were zero Google hits. So he, he was making a brand that, that people could find it. Um, so, yeah. He went from zero to 50,000 inspirations. Uh, anyway, moving on. So, this person who, when I was delivering this, I'd memorized his name, um, and I could look it up, but I'm not going to, um, turned this map into a real thing so that when you visit it, um, it puts you on the map. Um, unfortunately, of course, the ownership of all these blocks has changed in the intervening time. And also, um, I think I put this together in 2012, um, and if I go to this website now, it no longer works. Um, it's, it's meant to have the map somewhere in here, but I looked in the HTML and it's commented out. But you can go and, and see spots on the map for the last thousand people who've looked up addresses or whatnot. So it kind of works. So this person was inspired by the same cartoon that inspired me. And so then I thought, well, who else has been inspired? So I did, did the Google search. That's Randall Munro, by the way. Um, and he does good talks as well. Um, often at um, comic conferences. Um, yeah, so I did the search and um, found this article, um, which has since been turned into a listicle that says 18 something or others that were inspired by XKCD. Um, 
but I thought we'd, oh, yeah, this one, um, but I thought we would look at some of those. So he did this cartoon um, where a person came home and found out that the, his loved one had filled the room, made it into a ball pit. Um, so this guy, um, oh, I actually know this, there were, a guy this was inspired by that to make his own ball pit in his home. Then I think this was um, Last FM. This is their corporate office. They, they turned a room into a ball pit um, so people could go in there and um, have fun. Um, back on that article when I revisited it this year, um, it was pointing out that Last FM decided actually they needed the meeting room, so they got rid of the balls. Um, this one uh, involves Richard Stallman, which uh, he's been in the news of late. Um, so this, this is a cartoon where these people dressed as ninjas are breaking into his house and, and feigning an attack, and he assumed it was Microsoft coming to get him. Um, and they were really just messing with them. This inspired a couple of people to dress up as ninjas um, and uh, attack him playfully um, at a talk he was doing somewhere, which he might be doing less of now. Uh, this w was one where Randall was pointing out that Passwords that are long enough to be secure are often hard to remember. You know, this, this sort of thing where the system forces you to use some digits and some mixed case and some symbols, who could remember that? Um, whereas he um, suggested using a phrase like this with a series of words that aren't, it's a, it's a nonsensical um, sequence of words um, and that is long enough to be relatively secure whilst also being reasonably easy to remember and you can come up with a mental picture. So uh, that would be a good way to come up with a password for the master password on your password safe. Right. Okay. Um, so this guy, Toby Inkster, um, implemented that in Perl, so you can get that from CPAN, and it can generate passwords for you, and yeah, there are other, other implementations of that, but Toby was indeed uh, inspired by XKCD. Is there a CPAN Not that I'm aware of, no. But maybe there is. We could search it. <laughs> um, this uh, person and his partner had a fight and he woke up to find she'd written a sappy love note on the master boot section sector of, of his computer, um, which inspired someone <laughs> to make this thing that you can put on someone's computer and when they try and start it up, it says roses are hex code for red, violets are hex code for violet, I guess. Uh, <laughs> all of my base uh, belong to you. <laughs> Missing operating system. <laughs> they don't suggest you run it for some reason. I guess they don't want to get sued. This was a very silly one involving editor wars. Emacs versus Vim, and it just descended to the point where real programmers use butterflies. <laughs> butterflies. This is the butterfly effect um, to alter the the um, magnetic direction of the bits on the drive. So this person apparently wrote an Emacs butterfly mo editor mode and apparently this makes sense to um, Emacs 
users. It made no sense to me. Um, and this was a definition of hell. Um, Tetris with a um, round base, so that nothing ever lined up. Um, the, there is an implementation of that, but it's oh that sorry that's the um, that's the original cartoon. So someone made a Flash version, but of course nobody's got Flash anymore, so you can't play it unless you're so inclined. But now this page, if it ever loads, has an animation of what it would have looked like if if you you were. Right? It's almost worth spinning up a, a machine that you never want to use for anything else and installing Flash on it and hooking it up to the internet. Almost. Anyway, so that's that. Can't be many more of these left. Um, this one here, he was talking about how there's all these different ways you could exchange a file with someone. You need to give them a file. How can you do it? And they're all wildly impractical for the man in the street. And eventually he says, I'll, I'll just put it on a USB stick and, and drive over with it. Um, so I hired someone to make this thing. Um, there's probably a version with two hours that you don't want to go to. Um, but you can just drag a file onto here and it'll give you an e a, a link that you can then email to the other person and they can drag the file out and then it's done. It's gone, which is quite a good idea. Inspired by XKCD. Um, <laughs> this one here, um, this guy ordering things on eBay uh, just because they're cheap. One dollar items with free shipping. So he set up a script that buys stuff, one dollar a pop, and gives the people his address. And then one day he got a bobcat. Um, This person in New Zealand, down in Dunedin, I believe, made a trade me bot that um, worked similarly. He gave it a budget and it spent his money until it was all gone. Um, <laughs> and tweeted what he'd, what he'd bought along the way. Um, there's, there's a service in America called Bobcats by Post, and I, I, I haven't really looked into understanding what that's about. Because it does sound a little bit like animal cruelty, maybe. Um, this is the famous one, pseudo make me a sandwich. Or if you're really a weird person, yes you do make me a sandwich, but no one says that. Um, so uh, this person made a robot um, that would uh, make him a toasted sandwich on demand. Inspired by XKCD. You can even watch the movie, which we won't. And that's it. And as I say, if you search for that phrase, you'll find an article with many more examples of crazy things that people have done inspired by XKCD. And I'm not going to ask for questions because I couldn't answer them. So thank you. <laughs>